definitely gonna have to work on our early to mid game versus them and like what we want to do because they value like all the champions that can do that just have pressure and move around the map go for a team fight early as long as andy gets to control the early game when we come up against flyquest again and ryu and him get to like two men all over the map i think it'll be a lot easier because uh don't really care too much about their bottom line they like to play those pressure picks and stuff like that but I don't have me Cody and I don't have a problem dealing with pressure uh, like that and middle is just like easier place for us to like move around welcome back to the NLCS countdown just heard from Aframu and he has identified that the early to mid game is what 100 Thieves will have to shore up if they expect to come away with victory against FlyQuest but I was more interested to hear about the pairing that he keyed into that he thinks it's, it's going to yeah. be Anda and Ryu needing to come together as a duo to make stuff happen on the map. Yeah, so I think mid-jungle is just the most important roles in the game, essentially, and especially for early game, they just have the most control on the map. If you're winning mid and jungle, well, you can win top lane, you can win bot lane for your team, so I think that's why Afro realizes that. I think they're more focused on the fundamentals, and he's just pointing that out. Yeah, and I'm curious what your thoughts are on this, Darshan, when we're talking about post-20 minutes, what it is like to play against either 100 Thieves or against FlyQuest. Because 100 Thieves has about seven minutes more on their average game time than FlyQuest. And we always talk about 100 Thieves' vision control and the teamwork of these teams. But having played you know, multiple games against them during the split, have you noticed any like, differences of what it's like to play between the two? Yeah, so I think both teams have some distinct differences. I think they're actually both pretty good at the mid to late game. And when I'm playing against FlyQuest, I think they're more focused on champion mastery and abusing that as much as possible and rotating. So when I was playing against them, I think I was Cho'Gath, and mm -hmm. they had a Tom Kench. They would port on me under tier two tower and just instantly kill me. Yeah. No other team was abusing that with Tom Kench, right? It just looked like I was inting on stage, but I thought you know, they were actually playing it really well. And then you look at 100 Thieves, right? Um, I remember I was playing Mundo against his Darius, uh, Someday's Darius, and Someday had pressure that game. And 100 Thieves would constantly play to have Someday group, and they would have pink wards set up, and they would constantly play to pressure as a team, and they would be playing around like mid control and mid lane a lot. So I think that they have a really good understanding of the macro game and how mid lane is the most important lane when it gets later in the game. So I think it'll be really interesting to see how these teams uh, match up in terms of will FlyQuest work better with their champion mastery and rotating around the map, or will 100 Thieves work better because they have Aphromoo at the helm and they're, they have a really good understanding of macro because something about Aframu that team, people don't know is that he's really good in terms of post game and teaching people about how to be better at the game. So I think that's why they're they're so good at the macro. And yeah, you I see Afro getting ready for the game right there. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> meditating. I, that. sure. I think uh, another thing that's really interesting is when you get into the mid to late game, I think they're still slightly different stylistically where 100 Thieves play, like you've heard them talk about this annoying style where they want to pull you apart and make you react to them. So when they set up their 1-3-1, like, I don't think they, they move between the lanes nearly as much as FlyQuest does, because what they're trying to get you to do is commit to one side, and then on the other side will abuse you. Whereas FlyQuest, when they get the 1-3-1 advantage, they will then port, like, five people down to one lane and abuse that person who's left alone. And so 100 Thieves are more reacting to where you send your pressure and trying to move away from it, potentially, whereas FlyQuest feel like they're trying to, like, use all those globals that they pick to, like, run it down right through one of your lanes. I also think one of the interesting things that we kind of just or talked about yesterday again was the idea of adaptation and how important it is in a best of five mm -hmm. series. And so again, when when it comes to that macro control uh, or mastery from both teams, even if it's displayed in a different way, I'll be curious to see from game to game based on who gets the victory and who gets the defeat, how they decide to change things going into the next game to dismantle maybe the winning strategy the other team displayed. And I really want to see how JJ reacts to a best of five because this was his pretty much first split in the LCS, even though he subbed in a bit in spring. And I thought he did great. I thought as a shot caller, even as his Tom Kench play, he's been really good, but he is up against Aframu, who as Darshan mentioned, is used to adapting the best of fives through years of LCS experience. And it's gonna be a huge test for JJ. To be fair to JJ, he has played a ton of high profile matches as high profile as you can get as a rookie in terms of collegiate and academy finals. All right, well, the ready checks are going through on stage, so we're getting close. So it's time to send it to the casters to get into the start of the series. All right, thank you very much, Dash. Hopefully we're gonna be jumping in here in just a couple minutes for this quarterfinal bout between 100 Thieves and FlyQuest. And hopefully we get some exciting games, boys. 
yeah. I definitely think that will be on the table. Uh, if the tiebreaker was any indication, mm -hmm. you know, they do both have very good strengths, and they're pretty well defined. As they said on the desk, you know, a lot of the early game um, and specific champions working out for FlyQuest, but then 100 Thieves were still able to hold on. They come back in the late game, and you start to get that feeling like there's this inevitability that if you don't end the game quickly against this team, Aframu is going to direct them very well in the late game, and it becomes so difficult. But as Irene also brought up, you know, FlyQuest have been successful in a lot of base races late. Yeah, that's true. FlyQuest has been able to throw down and take the really risky ones. But that's the thing is FlyQuest games have actually been pretty damn exciting lately. They've been able to get early leads. They've been able to, when they don't get early leads, at least have not that feeling of inevitability, but at the same time, feel like they have the ability to end a game with a decisive call. It's basically, I love what Darshan was saying, it's macro versus mastery here between these two teams. 100 Thieves have that macro game, FlyQuest have that champion mastery. Also, also I just like listening in on uh, some of the team comms that we had before this, where uh, even in the play where Ryu jumps over the back of Baron after they got Baron and Afro made the call to go mid, uh, and Ryu went off on his own and he died and they lost a lot from that. Even after that, he's just like, it's okay, bro. Just tell us, you know, that you're going next time. No problem. And it's those types of things, staying composed, keeping your team upbeat in those late game situations that can really give you the edge. I mean, that's so important. What are you, what are you going to accomplish? Even if your teammate makes a play that's suboptimal by saying, man, that was bad. Now we're in a bad spot. Come on, what the hell's going yeah, on? Pretty sure that, he knows. That he does. <laughs> yeah. Nothing. yeah, when you mess up, you know. You're often the person who knows more than anyone else just how messed up the play was. Being able to have that team reliability to have your teammates say, no, it's all right, we're fine. It's still going to go forward. Mental is such a huge aspect of this game, and that magnifying glass, that lens, becomes so much more intense in a best-of series as well. It's so critical. Yeah, got to keep that mental strong. I actually got to talk to Robert Yip, who's the sports psychologist, or I guess the... Uh, coach behind the scenes for FlyQuest who helps them with their mental game. And he was saying that everybody on that stage has actually played best of fives before, right? Keen, Santorin, Flame, Wild Turtle. JJ had played some in Academy and also from uh, U of T, where University of Toronto and the collegiate scene. So they all have best of five experience, but he is still a little bit worried about up against FlyQuest because the games tend to go long, or up against 100 Thieves because the games tend to go longer. So it's a more taxing type of mental fortitude that you need where you need to have a lot of endurance. Yeah, and I do remember that interview from JJ too. He it sounded like he had the right attitude with it. He was excited to get more high pressure situations. He wanted to be, you know, put in more uh, more high profile playoff situations like this on bigger and bigger stages. Uh, so he has kind of his eyes ahead oh. as well on uh, oh. moving further. Well, the stage is set. The curtains are finally drawn. Let's see how the teams will compare as we're entering into champion select the first time today in this best of five. 100 Thieves on the blue side, FlyQuest on the red. The first ban from 100 Thieves, Tom Kench, the most played champion of JJ in the summer split. Not a surprise seeing that one banned. Yeah, what do you know? Despite the changes to Tom Kench and the nerfs to the Devour cooldown, they still don't want to give access to JJ to the Abyssal Voyage. Darshan was giving firsthand experience on how well FlyQuest have used this champion. Uh, to increase the tempo of the game and make those cross-map movements. And the question is, is, is something like Zoe going to jump up here or even Akali, right? The two mid laners here don't jump out to me as Akali players recently, but somebody like Ryu, you go back to the, park it back to the days. He was the other Zed in the Faker Zed versus Zed matchup. <laughs> he has played Assassins before. I, but... I don't know if that's the, <laughs> the, is that the what you want to reference? To hey, up? I'm that's just saying, not the memory you I am for. just saying that he has played them before. And also Akali, I believe, in the 38 games played on patch 816 there's only a single game where she was not picked or banned all right looking at the rest of the bands now that they're completed it's varus and rumble banned out by 100 thieves FlyQuest decide to take gangplank and recon off the board critically 100 thieves pick the braum for their support that is a huge pick for both of these teams yeah denying both the tom kench and the braum in a one two combination here uh to jj forces him onto something else that's what a lot of people were calling for uh, you know, with the FlyQuest lineup. As they also said on the analyst that Shen is a possibility, but I want to return to Zyrene's point about the Akali and about how prevalent it has been, not banned here yet, not picked either. Now, the 
number one and number two counter picks into a Akali uh, that pros have been talking about and that we have seen used successfully are the LeBlanc and you try and get those kills, it's a little bit more volatile, or the Galio, which seems much more like uh, the team play uh, and cross map sort of answer. Uh, that is a possibility. Still, she's not shown up though. Yeah, she hasn't shown up. What shows up here is the Kaisa, who's actually the most prevalent ADC on patch 816. And right now, she has a 16 and three in terms of win rate on 816. So she's Damn. the most picked. She's got an 84% win rate on this patch across 19 games. She's very powerful. People are kind of going for the Whoa. tank plus uh, hyper carry type strategy. Yeah, it's funny because uh, uh, she has gotten nerfed over and over since she came out, but people just keep jumping builds. Yeah, you just changed the yeah. item. <laughs> this champion has can scale off of every single stat in the entire game, so then you just move on over to the next sort of build. And right now, Storm Razor is so strong, the item is actually maybe a bit too strong, so pretty much all AD carries are rushing that, and it works very well with Kai'Sa, allowing you to get early upgrades to both your E and your Q. Well, if we're talking about getting going early and talking about hyper carry type champions, 100 Thieves were very quick to lock in the Tristana for Cody's son. They see the Nocturne on the enemy team. They pick something that can get itself away from it. They're also gonna grab the Rise there in the mid lane for Ryu as the final pick in the first half of the draft for FlyQuest is the Alistair. Yeah, and I've been definitely a big fan of the people trying to start utilizing Tristana. We saw it a little bit previously um, already in some kill lanes. But she definitely has a possibility if you have either Brahm or Alistar, the two supports in this game, uh, those have very high kill potential, especially if you get a gank, because she can close the gap with her rocket jump very quickly, has a lot of burst damage, and you get a stun from your support. Yeah, and she outranges the Kai'Sa here, so it's a good matchup for her throughout all points in the game. But the Alistar alongside the Kai'Sa gives you that gap closer. It gives you a way to add two plasma for her combo and burst people down. And I like that they have Engage here on FlyQuest to help force the issue, because 100 Thieves, one of the strategies that they love to go for is 1-3-1, one, one, the split push, which the Rise is gonna help with there. And the way you counter that is being able to engage with the Alistar and with the Nocturne. Yeah, Nocturne very good at trying to pick off people in the side lanes. And we've had multiple accounts from previous teammates of Aframu, how he greatly prefers in the later stages of the game to play multiple lanes at once and create push and pull pressure situations across the map rather than doing you know, just the standard group up, try and push down the turret or something like that. So Nocturne and Kai'Sa should be good at closing that gap. I would say he's a bit of a, a map investor. He likes to not put everything in one lane and just kind of put Diversify it out. your the, lanes. Exactly, rule number one of the investing. All right, second part of the bands are done now. 100 Thieves will go ahead, target the two different solo lanes here, Cassio and Nar banned out, while FlyQuest have now banned out all three of Onda's most played junglers throughout Summer Split. Graves, Trundle, and Kindred all taken out of the pool really trying to knock him down onto lower priority as they pick up the Cho'Gath for themselves. And this is interesting that they went and they picked the Cho'Gath because you could pick your mid laner here up against the Rise, but it might be 100 Thieves potentially flexing the Rise around and they're afraid of that because there has been Rise top lane that has mm -hmm. been played and they're just locking in this very solid champion for Flame even though the Rumble was banned away. And it's just going to be tank versus tank here. So really wanted to see the whole composition before they lock in the mid lane for Keen. Yeah, it's interesting that they are going to have someday here on the Orn duty as, um, you know, previously Orn had a lot of really good matchups in top side. Uh, pretty good laning phase as well as bringing the big team fight uh, presence with his ultimate. But recently uh, taken down quite a bit as far as the lane phase goes. And someday has been, you know, the big star player for this team in this split. He won't be the one, you know, dealing all the damage, right? He can set up the play with a good roam. We see it a lot of times where an Orn, if they get lane control, can roam towards mid lane, especially. You can have a long range ult to start something off, but Aside from that, it is going to be frontline duty. You can hear the <laughs> collective know. sigh of disappointment from nearly every voice in this audience as the Akali pick switches over to a much more tame Talia. But Talia will be the final pick of the draft on the side of FlyQuest. And you should get excited for Keen's Talia. Keen was one of the guys who made Talia jungle a popular issue. He was one of the mid laners. He got uh, auto-filled into jungle. He immediately spamming Talia. And he was the one who really popularized this in North America with a huge win rate as soon as the changes happened to the champion. This is a guy that has complete mastery of Talia. 
and goes right back to what Darshan was talking about on the desk. And I want to see what he does here because this goes back to kind of FlyQuest strategy from the uh, tiebreaker. They said the bottom lane looks like it might be the weakest lane. Focus down there, Wild Turtle Cody Sun. You have a Talia, you have a Nocturne. Go camp Cody Sun and try to make his day off. They've got the tools. Let's see how it works out between these two teams. The coaches are shaking hands. Everybody's getting fired up. It should be an exciting game number one here with the compositions that we've seen drafted so far. Yeah, I really do think these compositions complement the teams and their styles so well. On the side of 100 Thieves, you have a perfect team fighting comp set up. And on FlyQuest, you have a lot of globals to try and pick them up. Here we go. Here we go, it is game number one in this potential five game series to decide who is going to be the last of the four teams that will get to go to Oakland for the summer playoffs. And a lot of the desk was saying 100 Thieves heavily favored. You can't really disagree with that. It's the third seed versus the sixth seed. But from FlyQuest perspective, they actually feel like they match up quite well against 100 Thieves. They went one and two against them, counting the tiebreaker. And that tiebreaker was very close, and there was the potential for them to go two and one. So out of the teams that FlyQuest could have possibly matched up against, they felt like this is the best one for them in terms of they can get those early leads against 100 Thieves. They have the potential to close it out, and they're actually quite happy with this because they feel like they've been able to take some games off them, especially in things like scrims, too. They, they definitely have. And it, you were talking about it also helps that they had the jungler trade, and uh, they're from FlyQuest going over in the Meteos trade to 100 Thieves. So theoretically, they should have, you know, a lot of inside knowledge as far as how uh, the other team works. Whereas FlyQuest, they kept Santorin in. So it's not like they traded for... Uh, you know, 100 Thieves member and immediately had them on the roster. Yeah, they basically trained and uh, gave them away to 100 Thieves, got the jungler from 100 Thieves, Meteos, and Meteos has been able to share very intimate knowledge of the way that 100 Thieves has worked. And so, FlyQuest are very confident in this matchup here. And I mean, that and a trade, this was one that 100 Thieves fans were very skeptical of when it initially happened. They were saying, wow, this roster is doing incredibly. Remember back when this trade happened, when this switch up was there, 100 Thieves was tied for first at that point. And everybody was saying, is this really when you change the roster? And 100 Thieves said, yes, this is when you change the roster. And it has worked out with Anna. Yeah, and talking to some of the players, they kind of said that playing against 100 Thieves when they had Meteos was actually much harder, even in scrims. And then when Ando was there for, uh, for FlyQuest being able to kind of play against that, they said, all right, it's actually not as difficult to play against 100 Thieves when Meteos isn't in the lineup. So you know, fans, a little bit, I would say, uh, on the nose with the fact that maybe they aren't as strong with Ando, but they still have to kind of groom him to the team. See how this lane plays out here in the bottom side. You can see Cody Sun on that Tristana. Up against the Kaisa, so much hyper carry potential down here in the bottom lane, but both of these teams throughout the course of Summer Split have very low first blood percentages towards the bottom lane, so I feel like we probably won't see anything too spicy down here with these two just wanting to scale. Yeah, it is an interesting thing to look at here, right, with the teams, because the bottom lane is gonna be so important for both of them later into the game. Both of these champions do scale very nicely, um, and there are a lot of globals that will come online when the ultimates uh, become accessible for FlyQuest that they could possibly go down there. Beforehand, though, it will have to be, uh, you know, just some big plays from these supports. The supports are the ones in control of the crowd control down here on the bottom side, and they have they have actually both been leaders for their teams. Yeah, JJ came in. Remember, FlyQuest actually brought him on, and then it's like, oh, there's this change in the bottom lane. They started popping off as soon as he joined the roster with the combination that even pulled bands of Tom Kench, Barris taking away the Braum. The first three things that 100 Thieves did aside from the Rumble ban was basically focus the bottom lane in draft. Mid lane, Keen finds some good damage down onto Ryu there with that Talia early on, but you're not gonna see too much else just yet. Remember the Talia and Nocturne combination. This is something that every time you see these two champions drafted on the same team together, you want to see them roaming together. You want to see these two as this duo making life hell for the side lanes whenever those ultimates are up. You 
Bottom side, JJ just <laughs> gets a couple of slaps down onto Afro move but walks himself back away. Yeah, he was trying to break the freeze here, but you can see 100 Thieves, they've got Cody Sun back in place in time. Uh, it is Tristana, so you have uh, uncontrollable explosive shot that is going to do AOE damage, but they can keep the minions close to his turret for a decent amount of time by just last hitting there. Meanwhile, we do have uh, Santorin going for a lane gank here, free six on Nocturne. You can see by the map that he has cleared all of his camps, so that's the only reason he's going for this. Uh, he's not losing out on much efficiency. As soon as his re uh, Krugs do respawn, the highest value camp on the map, he goes right over to do that, and he should just finish up his clear, trying to get to that level six, get access to that ultimate we are talking about for making an impactful game. Yeah, and the question is, is what's going to happen here after those Krugs? Because the Scuttle Crab on the top side is coming up soon, and both junglers have looked at the top side because of that. Right oh. there, Flame spotted him. And this into the top lane. Flame quickly flashing away from this one. Still going to have to try to get out. Still gets stunned up. Rupture onto Anna, knocking him up into the air. Counter-attack comes in from Santora. The two wants to turn it. Continue for now. Someday going to be taken very low. Stun coming down onto Santora. Now, Someday still have to oh! walk away. He finds the Bellows breath into the first blood for Anda. Don't underestimate the shield. But Keen actually roaming up the river. Now, we're not done, Captain Flowers. Can Keen find revenge here? Someday is healing up through the potions. And is going to be taken low. Flashes over the seismic shove. Make sure he doesn't give a return kill. And 100 thieves get out clean. Yeah, went up there, went after the person who had flash still because Anda was able to body block. But that's still an advantage there. First blood going over to Anda. Off of basically making the same move that Santorin did, but someday has a little bit easier gank assist in the top side. Now we got the two versus two bottom lane. Aphromoo taken pretty low. Another fight here mid. These guys are scrapping all over the rim. Yeah, that is one of the earliest first bloods that we have seen for 100 Thieves. Them being able to turn that back around, I guess, in the counter counter gank as uh, Santorin got a little too amped up with the att extra attack speed off of his self spell shield block. Uh, was very important for them. The kill went over to Anda on the Sejuani. He could play the front line, get a little bit uh, tankier, quicker. And now they're just trying to face off over the Scuttle Crab. Scuttle fight. Fight. fight! Four man already. crab fight! FlyQuest has control over the ever so important crab, and Santorin secures it. Yep. That was actually, Anda didn't have Smite for the first few seconds of that. And so he was kind of delaying, being like, all right, well, let's wait a few seconds. And that's why they didn't jump the gun on it. And also that two-on-two two would favor the Nocturne most likely because there hasn't been a purchase yet. The spending of that gold really for Anda. The first flash came out, and there's all those stuns. The stun into the brittle, and Santorin comes in to try and save Flame. He does save him, but then the Bellows Breath just barely gets oh. him enough. Oh! And someday it has been so good this split. This is another play by him on the edge Baiting in, playing with his cooldown. One more second on that sucker to come back up. He turns it immediately around, talking in coordination there with Anda, and they pull it off. That was someday their top player. And Anda, the guy that he talks about just joining the team and then having to you know, meld with him and, and move, uh, move him onto the team, has worked out pretty nice. Someday really just has been top tier throughout the entirety of this split. Remember the performances not only we're seeing him on the Orn, we've seen him on tanks. The carries that we also talked about a little bit during Champions, like when we saw the Orn locked in. This was the man who held the line 1v4 as a Jax in a funnel comp where he wasn't the funnel. This is the guy who has made this team find successes in places where normally only failures would live. And even the fact that 100 Thieves ended the regular season lower than last split, but their performances from someday were incredible. They were night and day. Last split, he was the tank guy. This split, he's playing everything. He was able to play the bruisers, play the counter matchups, pull the things out that people didn't think were even good, and play them very effectively. And I've loved watching him. And there's a reason he got the all pro team. Meanwhile, from the FlyQuest perspective here, they do have that level six now on Santorin for the Nocturne. So Santorin now does have a lot more options. You have to be careful in these lanes, especially the ones with CC for setting up those ganks. Choo choo, it's time for the gank train, Kobe. We got Talia, we got the, the Nocturne ready with the ultimate. These two now have to set something up with those side lanes, make something happen to get that huge team play and bring this comp online. I completely agree. You need to start using your Nocturne ultimates as soon as you gain access to them. As long as you have the Caulfield's Warhammer, you have your 10% cooldown reduction. So let that thing rip. Uh, try and get some sort of advantage in lane. 
count the cooldowns. I mean, Flash would be only down on top side, but uh, I think there's a lot of good options bottom side as well. Yeah, you can either go for the gank top lane because someday doesn't have Flash, or you can try to track Anda and go after the Sejuani and get him because he doesn't have the Flash either. And I feel like you don't really want to play to the top lane. You want to play to the bottom lane here for FlyQuest. But the issue is that someday has Teleport and Flame doesn't. So if you make a bottom lane play, there's a big map advantage for 100 Thieves. Advan advancing into the enemy jungle now. Anda trying to contest this blue buff here. Saw that Santorin was doing it, decided to move up, dropped down a control ward of his own. Ryu's also hovering this fight, but 100 Thieves have brought multiple men to the party. And it looks like they will be able to bring this blue buff down rather easily. Keen going to take some damage there from Ryu off to the side as well. Ooh. And that is blue buff for 100 Thieves. <laughs> they wanted to give it over to Ryu, but Anda ends up taking it. Yeah. Fine on Sejuani, he'll be able to hand over their own to Ryu if they can just get back on the other side of the map. Uh, but that was pretty much all off of the pushing bottom lane there. Cody Sun and Afro move shoving in this lane, so they have priority. They can rotate up and help with the invade. And look at all the vision for 100 Thieves after the play as well. Yeah, all that bottom lane vision, which will set up a potential break. And that's why Anda's playing to that side. But also, TP advantage from the top lane because of the fact that that gank came through. So even if they decide to fight down on FlyQuest side, someday had backed up, he would TP in, and it would just be a really bad fight for FlyQuest to take. So because Flame died, they had to see that. But now there's a bottom lane play here. Oh, 100 Thieves really want to go in on this one with one of the Sejuani ultimate. But here comes the Nocturne ulti counterattack as well, just trying to buy some time, keep these guys blind. Into the fight they go, and there's the seismic shove. Santorin going to grab the kill onto Ryu. FlyQuest have found one hell of a counterattack, and they go 3 for 0. Oh. Triple kill Santorin. That's the other thing about the Globals and the semi-global ultimates. They are great for countering dives like that. FlyQuest completely flipped the table over. 100 Thieves are gonna lose out, not only on those kills, on the dive, but on the dragon as well. You were talking about it as soon as it was locked in, Kobe. The Talia for Keen, popularizing it in the jungle, making it basically showcasing the fact that this champion can be insane. And right there, that wall was picture perfect for that game. And Nocturne's one of those champions that needs to stay ahead of the curve of the game. Sejuani, you've always got CC. Nocturne getting ahead like this is great. Yep, right here, Wild Turtle. The dodge out on the ultimate was huge. And then the Nocturne denying vision, everybody's like, retreat. Now there's a wall there that you weren't able to see oh. come in because of the denied vision. They had no idea that they were retreating into that. It groups them all up into this little funnel position. Great seismic shove from him. Huge collapse there from FlyQuest. I think the idea from 100 Thieves uh, was a good idea, but the execution there, especially with uh, the teleport timers, a bit of a desync there. They, they should have known that they didn't have very much time to actually execute that dive with, because they're dealing with these two you know, semi-global ultimates. Yeah, and watching Someday in that replay, he had tried to back up, but the Nocturne ultimate, you can't TP during those six seconds. And by the time the dust had settled and Someday was ready to TP in, the triple kill had actually already happened. Yeah, you have to preemptively say, we're going all in on this bottom lane, five-man party down there. We're going to force this issue with FlyQuest, but the execution, a little bit off as far as the timing. And it's just so costly, because now, like I said, Santorin is far ahead, 3-1-0 on the Nocturne. Warrior with the Skirmisher Saber completed, has a stopwatch as well. Next time he flies into the fight, he doesn't have to worry about being immediately blown up afterwards, which could be huge for allowing this team that we applauded for their decisiveness to once again make one of those important calls. And there was a big part of that play where a lot of the carries for 100 Thieves, both Ryu and Cody Sun, no longer have Flash. That next ultimate will be one where you can go after Cody Sun, you can go after Ryu potentially, and open up the map, and it's a very easy gank to land. Yeah, Santorin is definitely feeling good now. Three kills, very, very much a fed Nocturne, and are ready to rip with another ultimate. Right now, they're looking at Ryu because he also used his flash in that last play, and JJ's even coming over to dive. JJ wants to help set this one up, but it looks like they don't really have everything in position right now. 100 Thieves knows that this is not a good situation to be in. They are going to get Ryu back a little bit as the top lane turns into a 1v1 that both guys back out. But that pressure that they just applied mid gives Kane a CS advantage and it allows him to make Ryu back up. But watch this, here, here he comes. Oh, he just flashed. Santorin decides it's time to go in onto that Orn underneath the turret. They go, fear coming out, damage going through, and Santorin goes on a rampage, four and one. And this is a game where we talk about it at the desk, jungle difference will be a key 
factor here. Santorin is fed. He is 4-1, and one, and he is basically taking over the entire game on this Nocturne early. We had Minos on the desk yesterday, and a lot of the pro junglers do talk about, you know, why you see Nocturne a lot in scrims, but not as much for some people in the actual games. Because a lot of people say you have to get fed on Nocturne. You have to snowball with it. Well, when you get three kills early on in an enemy tower dive that goes wrong, then this is the type of game that makes people pick this champion, right? Very easy to execute. Just pop the ultimate. He has plenty of damage to back it up since he's gotten so many kills. And now they get the turret, plus Rift Herald very low. 100 Thieves will run Ryu up towards this, but I doubt he'll have a whole lot to say unless he gets some sort of a weird and very lucky steal. That's not going to happen. Keen sticks around to pick up oh, the eye. Oh. But here comes the Ornhorn! Keen's knocked up into the air, and he'll be sent back to the spawn platform. 100 Thieves pick one up on the back. You got the eye. Worth it, you know. That's one where you got to pick it up, maybe get a turret in the future. But, yep, a lot of ultimates used there to get him to Sejuani as well as some days. But they didn't get the cleanse out of Keen, so he flashed. No cleanse uh, was burned there, so the next Sejuani ultimate, he'll still have a way out of it. And off of that, we have 100 Thieves making the early rotation here. They swap Cody Sun and Aphromoo up to the top side. Tristana try and just rush down this turret. With the extra time that FlyQuest spent on this Rift Herald, it wasn't just that Keen went down there. Everyone had decent recalls, so they won't be back out on the map. And it will be an extra turret over to 100 Thieves. Oh, well, they actually don't stick around to finish it because they do have deep vision. Yeah, because they also are a little worried of Santorin potentially lane ganking with an ultimate here because it's coming off a cooldown right now. And he's level 10. He's got a lot of damage behind him. He's going for a Black Cleaver build here, which would work quite well against the Orin and the Sejuani, but it's not that bursty build that you see. It's not the Chad build, it's solo kill. <laughs> <laughs> Does give you a bit more help to survive if uh, you're facing a lot of tanky champions on the other side, uh, and it's difficult to actually find your target. But here's another look, and again, this, if, if the enemies get a kill on you when you're getting the eye, and if 100 Thieves have been able to finish the turret afterwards, uh, due to everyone on FlyQuest having late recalls, then it wouldn't be worth it, because usually you don't get much more than a single turret with your eyeball. Right. But they weren't able to finish it off, uh, so we're still up in the air on this one. And there's a possibility, there is always a possibility of getting multiple turrets with an eye if you make a big play first. Those are the ones you like to see, right? Saving onto that big cooldown until you have a really good opening to get a lot with it. And even though the eye was picked up on the side of FlyQuest, they have not used it yet. Still have it ready to go. There it is. But oh. importantly, here we go. Shelly. That will yes. that All right. there we are. kill the turret. I think it'll do... It'll take it really low. It'll take it very low. And if they get some damage on it ahead of time, you can hit the eyeball once. There. All right, yep, down to about 10% HP on that turret, but FlyQuest, critically, they are ahead early on in this game. We're just about to crest the 17-minute point, and up against a team like 100 Thieves, the challenge to take it late. This is what you want to see, but now, are they going to be in some trouble? Or an ulti comes through, Nocturne ult used to disengage. 100 Thieves won't go in any further, and that is it. Yeah, and I think it was important, the Nocturne ultimate early activation here by Santorin, because that made it hard for Someday to yeah. see his target. Keen had cleanse, and he was trying to hit him with the second activation of Orn, but that's a really intelligent Nocturne play. A lot of people will only use it for your, your tunneling in and using the ultimate to try and kill a Squishy, but the blackout, the darkness is so good in pro play, and he uses the, it defensively there to save a teammate. And I think that's a key difference between somebody who's picking up the Nocturne or somebody who has mastered the Nocturne is using the ultimate in a defensive way. Even if you aren't a part of that fight or gonna dive in, just use it to deny vision and spook people, right? It's called Paranoia for a reason. It's aptly named because you can also make it so people don't, they start playing around their AD carry as soon as that's blown because they're waiting and trying to think that you're gonna go in and waiting to counter. Well, off of shutting down the 100 Thieves play in the mid lane, FlyQuest did take their second Cloud Drake of the game. 100 Thieves respond by finally finishing off the last bit of HP on that top lane tier one turret that Cody was working on earlier. So it is an objective trade at the end of the day once the dust is settled. Cody Sun with that Storm Razor working now on the next item, trying to scale up when that's done. And as we do start to enter the mid game here with towers falling on both sides, we get to look at what these teams actually want to do with their champion profiles here. Uh, of course, FlyQuest. Now there's more room for them to try and take advantage of the Taleo wall and Nocturne ultimate combination. Santorin hitting level 11 now, rank two Nocturne ultimate. He still is the fed one on the team, and he's going to get more cooldown reduction with that Black Cleaver build. 
uh, to try and really keep uh, up the pressure in these side lanes. Whereas 100 Thieves, they want their tanks near their carries so they can protect them. And it's a lot more simple to execute. And it's a lot more kind of the history of this team, right? They were built on protect Cody Sun style when he's on, you know, later game carries. And I love what you're talking about, Kobe, because it's that macro versus mastery once again, where 100 Thieves, the macro-based team, they'll play around Cody Sun, they'll move this big cannon around, be like, there's a turret, knock it down, and then protect it and escort it to the other lanes. And FlyQuest, it's that mastery. Keen on the Talia, Santorin on the Nocturne here, showing that they have full understanding of these champions and their execution behind them. And that's what's going to make the difference here for FlyQuest, because they have a gold lead in the early game here, and they are down in turrets. They are up in Drakes as well. But the question is, is can they actually stop Cody Sun from coming online as a Tristana? At the same time, we're talking about Cody coming online, Tristana scaling, everything's great there. Let's not forget about Turtle, who's on a champion that scales incredibly well at the same time. And remember Cody's words about not being worried about FlyQuest because he went 0 and 6 against him and still won? <laughs> he still went 0 and 6 against them, including multiple solo deaths to Wild Turtle. Well, he set that bar for himself, right? You set a very low bar. I just have to do better <laughs> than going 0 6 and will win. I'm not quite sure that that's actually true uh, because, as you point out, Kaisa here is very close to Rage Blade as well. And once Turtle gets that, they can delete targets so quickly by jumping on them and hitting them with any form of crowd control uh, that 100 Thieves really are going to have to watch their positioning. That's why you can see Aframu calling for Anda to group up with them when they go for this vision. Yeah, and they need to get this turret quickly. Pop of the cleanse to keep himself safe yet again. Second part of the Ornhorn Horn will knock him up in the air. Santorin will try to defend this one along with Keen, but they won't be able to hold it any longer. That's the third turret of the game going over to 100 Thieves. That's the final link in the outer turret chain. Knockdown. And they still have a gold deficit here of almost 1,000 gold. FlyQuest are about to knock down and counter turrets mid because they've just brought Wild Turtle. It only needs some finishing touches on it. And that bottom turret is also about half HP. So FlyQuest, they need to knock this one down, knock the bottom one down, and then make sure that they can set up for Baron. Oh, Hold here on. comes the Wombo combo into the dive, and Ryu is delayed. FlyQuest knows how to go in, and they pull off that one successfully. Weaver's Wall coming in from the side, seeing if maybe they can find any more. Cody Sun's not going to be taken down just yet. Someday there on the front line, Aphra, who also throwing up the shield, knocked back into the team a little bit further, though, still getting himself away. No summoner spells extended, expended, excuse me, as FlyQuest walks out five minutes. Long. And it's JJ on the Alistar. Such a huge pickup for this FlyQuest team. Team. They have found so much success with this guy. He makes the call, pulls the trigger with the tower dive. They execute it, and they get out in time for the reset here. I mean, the guy won Academy last split. I mean, he has a banner up there because of it for FlyQuest, and this was so fast. That's a snap engage. Ryu even has Flash, but it's just too quick on the execution. And actually, Flame landed the Rupture first with Cho'Gath, so you're mentioning the Flash. I mean, as soon as you see that Rupture, I think Ryu should have flashed out of there. As soon yeah. as Flame had that under his feet, uh, he was a bit greedy trying to walk out of it. He wouldn't even even been able to walk out of it. And then JJ's like, there's definitely no way you're getting out of here. <laughs> yep. As he went in as well. Uh, so definitely credit to Flame as well with the Rupture to start it out. But that is now five <laughs> kills for Santorin. As much as a bunch of kills just went over for minion kills to Ryu, all the kills for FlyQuest are literally on Santorin on this Nocturne. And that is cool for the Nocturne. As you get super late into the game, it's not necessarily the best distribution of gold, but for the mid game, it can be very powerful. Every kill in this game is on a jungler, Kobe. Look Hell at yeah! 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 He's got all the kills too. It is jungle, 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 jungle this game so far in terms of who's cashing in on the kills. I feel like I'm the only jungler who doesn't like getting the kills. Because That's you're, definitely because true. you're yeah. trying to play the, you're over here trying to play Mr. Team Player, don't worry, I'll help my team. Kobe and I are trying to 1v9. They help you guys help your team by carrying. Yeah, I, exactly. I, I want other people to carry. But hold on, Keen. Good lane. Keen keeps himself alive through the Ornn Ultimate. TP gonna be coming in from behind. These guys, Santorin goes uh -oh. in, utilizes the stopwatch. Flame gonna be going after them two into the back line now as well. JJ trying to knock up one to one. Someday still gonna be tanking, goes into a stasis of his own, stunned down onto JJ. More damage coming through from Keen now onto the side, throwing out the threaded volleys, almost getting himself knocked up into the air. Flash away as Ryu goes Ryu. forward, looking to find the damage, grabs JJ. And FlyQuest still continues retreating. We'll see if they can find anything, but it looks like they're done. Ryu holding onto his flash from before, doesn't use it in a defensive manner. He wants to get the kill with it. He flashes in and he gets some payback there. Money off of JJ. And now 100 Thieves are looking at the Baron. They found their way into the Hit, they're knocking down the control wars. 
They're not going to go for the play just yet. Instead, going for the TP. Looking to punish FlyQuest for sticking around here, seeing if maybe they can make anything happen instead. Now, reuse back onto the map. Has full HP. Just went back. Shop. TP'd in. Now it's Baron attempt for 100 feet. Yeah. Starting up the Baron here. They just threw down the blue trinket, so they know that it's started. Santorin is so low that this is a bait to turn in most likely. They see three there. They don't see the two in the bush. It was not scouted there in the pixel. Yeah, Santorin is so easy to kill. No flash, no ultimate on Nocturne. Extremely low health. 100 Thieves, though. They can't take it down quick enough. JJ does arrive. It's a very slow Baron take from the Thieves. Weaver's wall comes out. will be blocked up by Aphra. Move good unbreakable there to make sure that doesn't go any further. FlyQuest stops the Baron attempt, and they don't lose anyone for it. And that was some really good patient play from FlyQuest not to completely lose your mind in that situation. So many times at that stage in the game, it's completely dark. You don't have vision on Baron. They're on the Baron. You feel the need you know, to put a stop to it. But the patience here from FlyQuest pays off big. Not only do they stop the Baron, but they can also pick up the Drake afterwards. Call me a uh, conspiracy theorist here, but this feels like you know, FlyQuest having Meteos being able to be like, how do they like to play? This is how they're gonna play. These are the bluffs that Hunter Thieves like to throw down. And having that type of knowledge of play style is so helpful because FlyQuest showing that type of patience is uncharacteristic of them in the middle of the split. They demonstrated more of that later. And right here, speaking of patience, Ryu, he got feared by the Nocturne. He had a Cho'Gath flash at him. He holds on to it the whole time. Like you said, Kobe, the patience that Ryu showed here, spreading the E and then the flash combo to get JJ. JJ going down there. The one death throughout the entirety of that whole massive fight goes the way of 100 Thieves. That's oh. the first kill this game that's not on a jungler, so I guess Every good thing must come to an end, Kobe, but extra money on Ryu is always a good thing here for 100 Thieves. If you look at the damage charts from the last fight, though, it's Keen's Talia that we were praising earlier that once again shows up, landing so much damage with those consistent volleys. And you talk about the, all the kills being on the junglers, and the, if you examine the last team fight, Santorin, this guy with all the kills for FlyQuest on the Nocturne, went in onto Ryu and got him to half health, but Ryu still got to stay in the fight. Santorin had to flash out afterwards, and this is a, a problem that you see develop later with Nocturne picks in pro play, uh, the team fighting. But here we go. FlyQuest decided to go after Sunday. Is that going to be the pick? Yes, it is. Flame takes him down first and foremost, but now onto the front line. The Cho'Gath's also going to suffer as Afro Moon and the rest of 100 Thieves retreat back into the jungle. Cody Sun off the side, ready for the flank if they need him. 100 Thieves trying to regroup, get themselves back in position, but FlyQuest has priority over the mid lane. Reed oh. deciding to use the ulti to get them into a defensive position onto the tier two turret. A couple more auto attacks will take it down. Hurdle makes sure of that one. It's now FlyQuest has but to get themselves out, but they're deciding to re-engage. JJ's gonna be on the front line and left for dead as FlyQuest heads out. JJ went for the headbutt pulverized, but he got stunned by the Braum stun as he was Wing, so you can't Q, and it headbutts him out of Keen's W. Keen had the knockback coming, and then he knocks him out because of the stun. Yeah, JJ, he was caught there with the slow from Braum Q and didn't want to use his flash defensively. So even though he dies there, you know, he decides to turn and try and go for the, the headbutt play. I still like keeping this very important cooldown for Alistar in your flash for a possible bigger reward of a team fight uh, soon to follow. Here we go, though. They annihilate someday here with the true damage from the Beast, but Togat shows uh, falls right afterwards, so it's completely evened up. And that was another one where Santorin uses the ultimate, denies the vision, and then right here, this is the play where JJ, he gets marked, and then you see him get stunned. I believe it procs right as he W's in. So Cody stuns hit him once, twice. Oh, it doesn't actually, oh. What? You just missed the kill. Okay, Q. interesting. Was that, I'm, I'm very unsure on that, because it looked like he got stunned, because there was a bit of a stutter there. But either nope. way, nope. either uh -oh. way, no, he goes in, uh -oh. he gets taken down. And that's the second kill of the game for Ryu now on this rise. You can see the Seraph's Embrace, the Morello Namicon both completed, still has a stopwatch ready to go for Stasis. And when you looked at Someday in that fight and how quickly he evaporated, look at the itemization. It's Frozen Heart, it's a Chain Vest, it's Abyssal Mask, which, yes, has some health on it, but overall, you are very vulnerable to the true damage from this Cho'Gath. Definitely true, and he hasn't 
fix that problem yet. Here they're on Baron right now. Keen with the wall. Wait, Keen Weaver's walls 100 thieves away. Baron's still gonna be taken down pretty quickly, but it's not gonna be, be quick enough to get Flame. Mike came out. Flame gonna be trusted to take this one down. Beast goes through. Now can FlyQuest get themselves away without too much punishment? It's Flame on the front line that's likely to sacrificial Watch Shogat. Orin. Can't get himself over the wall. Orin looking to use the ulti. Maybe grab somebody else. Not gonna Ooh. find the knockup with that one. Santorin's still looking to get away. Spell Shield keeping him alive for now, but it will not block the shot. Shut down for Cody Sun. And true to form for 100 Thieves, it is Cody Sun picking up these kills. Red buff on Tristan at level 15 now. They get to push for turrets afterwards, even though the Baron buff picked up by FlyQuest, the turrets to 100 Thieves. What is the price of a Baron? And that is the question that FlyQuest has to answer as 100 Thieves march down the mid lane. Inhibitor turret number one is gone. Inhibitor will not be contested. Keen will try to just throw some spells in there, but they won't be able to hold it. And that Baron start from FlyQuest, they thought that they'd be able to just 100% get it there. They had the tempo advantage. The Keen wall was great to set it up, but then FlyQuest, they get caught by the, all of the chase that's available to 100 Thieves. It is a really good example of why Rise, a very low win rate champion for solo queue, is so highly prized in professional play with the Realm Warp allowing that chase. Now they're re-engaging. JJ goes in, but he goes in very far forward in front of the rest of his team. There's not the opportunity to really follow that one up too well, and FlyQuest just ends up backing away. Yeah, Flame cancels the teleport there. Gonna try to use the Baron buff in the mid lane as well as potentially move around the map here and set up for the third Cloud Drake for FlyQuest, who still have a very slight gold lead, but they have map pressure all against them from that mid lane inhibitor being down. This has really been a game of trades, an ebb and flow of power. And now after a reset here from 100 Thieves on their hard push, it's FlyQuest's turn to get right back out on the map, make use of the Baron. They're trying to push, recoup some of that gold. They've got one turret down, pushing on number two. Here comes the Ornhorn. JJ's knocked up into the air. The Alistair ultimate not keeping him alive. Cody Sun goes on a killing spree. Flame into the front, still gonna be tanking up so much for so long. Flashes away, keeping himself alive. 100 Thieves looking to chase after this one, see if maybe they can find somebody. Late game positioning once again from JJ. Last time I said, Oh, it's good that he's not using his flash defensively to get out of there, but you can't keep putting yourself on the front line. They're gonna counter. FlyQuest trying to turn this one around. Turtle into the back, looking to find the damage under Ryu and gets himself away for now. And is still gonna be looking to go after Turtle. Flames taking down a rampage for Cody Sun. Not enough damage coming out of Turtle just yet. FlyQuest are routed. Santorin's gonna be taken down next. Turtle stands alone. He's a double kill for Cody. As the resurrected Santorin comes back only to fall again. Ryu goes on a killing spree as topside the minions wail on the turret. And 100 Thieves now have control of the, all the team fights. Cody's son is popping off now. It was a silent early game for him. He's now 5 0 and 4. He has the most gold in the game. And a lot of that is off of the. He got the kill on Santorin, who was the Fed Nocter. Surprise, surprise, Irene. 100 Thieves, 30 plus minutes into the game. Team fight. They get one mistake from FlyQuest and they take the game this should be the end unless keen and jj can work some kind of a miracle jj tries to go in on this one afro moves gonna be taken low seismic shoving to cody who jumps away flame has managed to get himself oh, back oh. Fight. cody's gonna be taken down likely right here but it will not be enough or will it uh. with cody out of the picture it does not matter next is fall and these take game one and that is basically a setup for the way this matchup has gone historically the early lead there for FlyQuest. It looked like 100 Thieves. They're gonna have to rely on the macro, and it's the punish that came up huge. Back to back team fights. JJ on Alistar gets slowed out in a frontline position, does not use his flash to get out defensively, trying to save it for later for an offensive play. But you get no chance to make that offensive play if your Nexus dies off of that fight. Yeah, that's one where you have to look back at it and be like, all right, he has to pull the trigger very aggressively. And we saw FlyQuest do that with something like a Baron pull, but they got punished for it. And that's one where you have to kind of rethink it and say, okay, was that the right play to go for? And it was mis mis-execution, or should they have not gone for that Baron in the first place? And let's go back to how FlyQuest got the early leads because the initial turnaround on the turret dive, it looked great. Santorin got rolling. Hell yeah, we got a Nocturne. He's fed, everything's going on, except, oh wait, now we're at a part in the game where we have to dive onto Ryze or Tristana, and it's just not in the cards. Yeah, and he ended up just being a walking bag of gold, gave 750 gold over to Cody in one of those fights where 
now he can't really dive the back line with the ultimate. He didn't have enough damage to really pop anybody, and that's where that uh, Nocturne needed to get more out of the early advantage. Nocturne well, problems. Just Nocturne problems. For more on how game one played out now, let's go ahead and send it to the State Farm Analyst Desk. Thank you very much, gentlemen. 100 Thieves coming out in, on top, rather, in our first game of the best of five. But I feel like this game one, in a lot of ways, provided a lot of evidence, uh, at least uh, towards a lot of the questions that we raised in the pregame around, hey, early leads built by FlyQuest, how 100 Thieves would respond, the champion dependencies of FlyQuest, and how that would be dealt with in champion select and or maybe alleviated uh, by in-game play. And so I just want to dive into the discussion around answering some of those questions first from our pregame coverage. I think it's interesting to see the two early kind of power pick bans around top lane. You have the Rumble and GP banned out respectively, and then as well as the Tom Kench ban against JJ, and then the Braum first pick kind of indicates both teams understanding what the other one wants to do. Yeah, I think this is one of those series where they've kind of got it figured out, like, this is how this team works. And I think you saw JJ just had an awful game. Like, on Alistar, he was getting caught out constantly and just positioning really poorly. And I think it just shows you, I think, the most important thing for draft is getting Tom or Braum for JJ. So I think yeah. next game, you're going to be seeing that, them trying to get that. Yeah, I'm hoping that Hunter Thieves just bans those two things on red side and just kind of dares JJ to play something else. Uh, the other thing uh, about... This game is I thought I thought Sedge was actually going to be a power pick in this series, so I didn't like the Nocturne from Centaurin. Sure, it started five and zero, and you can make the argument that if they would have played properly, it would have won. But I, I just like Sedge more for them when they have a tank look from Centaurin, and also Rise is a mid lane power pick in this series, I think as well. And Ryu looked really comfortable on that champion. It's it's a weird game where like I actually liked FlyQuest comp in a lot of ways. I felt like they had the scaling advantage in both the marksman and top lane tank position, which is usually two times where I'm like, all right, so you should have a, a pretty good front line and you should have a really good back line. Uh, but they, I don't feel like with those Alistar mistakes where he wasn't going in at the right times that they were able to really convert those. And of course, the other big part of this is the fact that all these advantages by FlyQuest were kind of keyed off of a big mistake by 100 Thieves. Yeah, I. I thought this was a really interesting point in the game because both teams were kind of stuck into not doing much because of the threat of the bot lane dive and the shove and 100 Thieves did pull the trigger. Because FlyQuest had been holding Nocturne off, they were able to turn it. I thought that was well done by FlyQuest. Right. Early advantage picked up by FlyQuest. How should they have closed out that game? Because we talk about having early leads and maybe some difficulty in the macro game of closing, but if you've got a fed Nocturne, what are the steps that need to be taken to actually win this game one? I think decision making wise, they were making fine decisions. Yeah. It's just like, watch this. Like, JJ is going to end up ahead of the rest of the team and gets focused down because, unlike Braum and Tom Kench, you have, I think, less defensive tools outside of just your ultimate. Yeah, I mean, I think not with Nocturne, you want to be abusing the side lane a lot more. And I think it's good for FlyQuest to abuse the Cho'Gath win condition here, but it just goes horribly wrong and they lose an inhib out of it. So I think these teams, it's going to come down to mid game a lot. Like, who can get the better mid to late game team fighting? When I see 100 Thieves team comp with really straightforward, easy engage with Sejuani and Orn, and I see Braum with when it's a hyper carry versus hyper carry situation, I'm going to give the game to 100 Thieves. Like, mm -hmm. you're not seeing these teams like going straight out the gates, taking an early game lead, and just snowballing the game. No, it's going to be it's going to be one of those series where every game is going to go to like 30 minutes. It's going to go to mid lane. 5v5, like, you know, playing that, like, slow fighting style, and the first person to make a mistake is going to lose the game for their team, and I think that you're going to keep seeing that happen over and over. If I'm FlyQuest's coach, I'm going to say, how can we get JJ, Tom Kench, and Braum? And if I'm 100 Thieves, and I ban Tom Kench and Braum, I, I think 100 Thieves is going to go away with another win, because I think FlyQuest is definitely going to choose blue. Yeah, and when you say first team to make a mistake, you're meaning first team to make a mistake post-25 minutes, yes. right? Because the early game advantage was granted the FlyQuest. And to your earlier question, Dash, I, I do feel like the Baron play was the right idea. It just falls down to execution. And the fact that Cody's son got the shutdown gold on the Nocturne kill, and he got... I think multiple shutdown golds throughout the game really put him ahead to be able to be that late game carry. And that, that, that's one of those things where FlyQuest is just, it, it's a hard loss to take in that sense because they're like, okay, we should have done this, but we just should have done it better, <laughs> right? Well, and, and I feel like that's a lot of FlyQuest losses. Yeah. Is, is in a position to win, making some intelligent moves or making the right decisions, executing just under, you know, the degree that's necessary to come away with that victory, and then how do you actually stomach and, and metabolize that loss or actually pull a learning out of it to go ahead into game two and say, mm -hmm. now if we do this, we will win.
I don't know if it's too early to start going for big adaptations, but you don't have to do tank versus tank in the top lane. I think uh, the early bans that both of them kind of opted into, FlyQuest and say, we'll start dropping those, and then we'll start playing like the GP metagame, where like, we pick GP, so we have the scaling advantage, and now you need to punish it. You can do some stuff like that. Now, before we reframe the discussion towards game two, it's playoffs, and lots of veterans talk about the postseason buff that pushes pros to make an outplay or split push to victory. Then there's the buff that makes a teammate just want to say, I'm helping, presented by State Farm. In this game versus 100 Thieves, Keen makes, uh, makes rather the wall that grants his teammate Santorin an early game triple kill. Let's take a look. Yeah, I'm shooting right. Here we go. We'll keep fighting. I'm on rise. 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 He's one HP. Go go go. He's ignited. He's ignited. Looks really good. It's really yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, looks really good. We, go, go, we, go, go. we kill them all here. Nice. Push your side. That's really good. Nice. No. Great play to secure an early advantage. Unfortunately, they can't capitalize on that advantage to ultimately take the victory. So now looking more closely at game two and what adjustments should be made, I'll let you guys know that FlyQuest has elected to remain on red side. This is their choice. What? Jet, top of show, you said blue side is so important. The win rates for both of these teams on blue side are through Whew. the roof. So how does this make you, I mean, how does this make you Red feel? Red Sun's <laughs> better on the yeah. uh, Jack, It makes me feel like better it? about my 100 Thieves prediction dash, I'll tell you that. <laughs> TSM that won on the Red TSM, side. TSM won on the Red Side. <laughs> so I know. There, there's, there is strategy around there. I think if they would have taken Sejuani instead of Nocturne there, they could have had the better 5v5. They still got Kaiza, which could give them a better late game carry. There's things they can do on the Red Side to do an improved version of this. But the reason I don't like it is this, to me, says they have a pick that JJ can play. I was gonna say, there's no way you get Braum or Tom Kench on red side yeah. as Flyquist. Right, because 100 Thieves has already shown they're willing to first pick Braum. So maybe they're gonna ban Braum as well, drop one yeah. of their other bans and think they're gonna get like Rise Sege as the one two or something. So th it could work. On the season, they're three and nine red side, seven and one blue side. So that stat's bad. That, that stat sucks, sure. But if we're talking about red side counter pick, on top lane being very important, as well as the fact that Red Side has the advantage of last picking first phase, a top laner then double ban encounters against it. You can drop that GP ban, which I think they had, or maybe it was the Rumble. One of those two they had on, on that side. And you put the Braum in there instead. You go for one of these power picks you're talking about, Sej Rise, and then you can go your solo lane, mm -hmm. last top, just take it and double ban if you need to, or you can right. save counter pick if the other side's mm -hmm. doing it. It They can do more in the draft than we saw in, in that one. So that, I'm willing to entertain the Red Side, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> that, I don't love it. I, I really don't understand why, because I think they could have gotten the Tom or Braum, Braum on blue side, but on red side, if they're going to stick with that, what I want to see is them putting Santorin on, like, Sejuani, like we're saying. I think the Nocturne's okay, but I think them having a team fighting engaged tank, way better. Try and get Flame on the counter pick carry, and then don't put JG on Alistar again. Go for the Shen, okay. because that's a, that's a pick that a lot of mm. people are doing in LCK, even in other regions, where when people pick Braum, they go Shen, and I think that's way better. If you get Flame on a carry and Centaur on a tank, now we're talking, but... Their red red side win rate is abysmal. Like why? <laughs> Just get Tom Catcher Braum on blue side. Like those yeah. scratch we hadn't seen yet. It's the red More side. More questions strat. raised. Yeah. More questions and curiosities raised by FlyQuest picking red side. But I'm sure we'll have some answers soon enough as we return for game two. See if FlyQuest can tie up the series after the break. Everybody here, like, they care about each other, and everybody wants to win, and everybody works really hard. And, like, I couldn't ask anything more of a team. Stun coming down onto Santora now. Someday still have to oh! walk away. He finds the bellows. Brass into the first blood for Randa. Into the fight they go, and there's the seismic jump. Santora gonna grab the kill onto Ryu. FlyQuest have found one hell of a counterattack. I have to just now. Thank you so, thank you so. Nice, 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 nice. Ooh. Tries to knock up with that one. Santorin's still looking to get away. Spell shield keeping him alive for now, but it will not block the shot. Left side, pump, left side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, Cody, you can jump, you can jump, you can jump. I got the Kaisa. 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 Cody's going to be taken down likely right here, but it will not be enough, or will it? With Cody out of the picture, it does not matter. Nexus falls. Welcome back to Assist of the Week. During a heated match of 100 Thieves against Echo Fox, 100 Thieves tried to solidify their lead by tower diving Dardoch. It wasn't enough, and 100 Thieves gave Echo Fox the chance to go on the offensive. With an excellent knockup by Smoothie and a slow from Hooney, Echo Fox locked down four kills. Watch out, Alistair. He's only at 1,000 health, but they're gonna get that first kill. A shutdown. The kill goes there right to the mark to Kindred. 